Uh, wonderful, thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you for inviting me to present at the second Animal Welfare Conference here in Indonesia. Uh, it's a real honour to be here and to be part of this wonderful event. So, my name is Karen O'Malley and I'm the Programme Manager for Four Pauses campaign to end the dog and cat meat trade in Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. I'm here today to speak a little more about the dog and cat meat trade more widely around the world. I'm going to start off by sharing a global perspective to identify dog and cat meat consumption hotspots before touching on the concerns around animal cruelty and suffering, as well as the impact of the dog and cat meat trade on human health and welfare. I'll then spend some time reflecting on the legislation from both a national and local perspective, detailing some of the approaches adopted by governments and local authorities in their efforts to end or curtail the dog and cat meat trade. Finally, I'll spend a few moments to share some of the work of Four Paws um, that we've been focusing on as part of our campaign to end the dog and cat meat trade in Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. So let's think a little bit more about the dog and cat meat trade. According to sources, approximately 30 million dogs and 10 million cats are slaughtered yearly to sustain the trade. Dog and cat meat is suggested to be consumed out of necessity, but also for cultural, superstitious, ritual and medicinal purposes. And I think it's worth noting that wherever the dog and cat meat trade occurs, it is becoming an increasingly contentious and divisive issue. I think this is especially the case in areas where there's an increasing popularity of pet ownership and where there's been a media, uh, global media coverage of the cruelty and risks associated with the trade. Next slide, please. Wonderful. So as you can see from the map, um, Asia is the continent on which the consumption of dog meat is the most widespread, uh, with as many as 30 million dogs being killed for con human consumption every year. The number of cats is unknown, but likely to be in the millions. Anecdotally, the consumption of dog meat is said to be most common in China, with around 10 million dogs and 4 million cats, Vietnam with 5 million dogs and 1 million cats, and Cambodia, 3 million dogs, and here in Indonesia, an estimated 1 million dogs. Uh, the Nagaland region in India is also known for its dog meat consumption, as well as around 20 African countries with Nigeria being the largest dog consumer, um, dog meat consumer on the continent, uh, where it's believed the meat cures malaria. Dog meat is also consumed in Switzerland, in Europe, um, but in significantly lower amounts than in Asia. Next slide, please. So for those of you that may be less familiar, many aspects of the dog and cat meat trade involve varying levels of cruelty. In some countries, legally registered dog meat farmers breed dogs intended for human consumption, while in others, research has shown the horrendous suffering inflicted on dogs and cats as they are taken from the streets or stolen from their homes. In fact, many of the dogs and cats found in markets commonly wear, are still wearing their collars, indicating that they were once pets. We know that pets can also be actively sold into the trade by their owners for behavioral reasons, for financial needs, or for trading them in exchange for kitchen utensils. During their journey to the, um, the slaughterhouse, many of them are transported long distances, sometimes on journeys lasting for days. Uh, they're often packed into tightly packed cages without food, rest or water, and often suffer from injury or disease. Slaughtering methods can vary, but can include bludgeoning in drowning, having their throat slits, or being electrocuted. And often these animals can spend days in cages uh, w without food or water whilst they await their fate. Next slide, please. The animal welfare issues associated with the dog and cat meat trade are enormous and definitely constitute an unobjectionable reason uh, to terminate the trade. But it's not only animal welfare that is at stake. The trade also presents implications for human health and welfare, and Karan touched on some of those in the earlier session. For example, there is a recognised link between the dog meat trade and rabies, making it incompatible with national and global rabies elimination strategies, such as the 0 by 30, which recognises on ending human deaths from dog-mediated rabies by 2030. 
All of these considerations can be seen to negatively impact a country's reputation across the globe. Next slide, please. So recognising this negative impact, an ever-growing number of countries and localities have explicitly banned the slaughter and sale of dogs and cats for food, whilst others have adopted various approaches on grounds of animal welfare, as well as public health and safety and disease control and eradication. So I thought it would be interesting now to talk about some of the different legislation surrounding the topic for us to consider uh, the and the variety of approaches that could be adopted to end the dog and cat meat trade at a national level. So I'm going to go through some of these uh, just to show you the variation. So back in 1950, Hong Kong became the first locality to issue a local ordinance and that regulation stipulated that no person shall slaughter any dog or cat for use of food uh, and no person shall s <laughs> uh, sell or use, uh, permit the sale of the uh, flesh and meat of dog and cats for food. Whilst in Thailand, despite never really having a significant history of dog and cat meat consumption, legislators banned the slaughter of dogs and cats and the sale of their meat in 2011, uh, 2001 by amending the existing Animal Protection Act of 1993. Unfortunately, due to a loophole, this led to the emergence of a thriving underground market. And in 2017, legislators responded and became the first territory in Asia to ban the consumption of dog and cat meat. So in India, dog meat consumption is prohibited uh, through food safety and standard regulation of 2011. However, reports suggest that this is poorly enforced. And in the states of Nagaland, Mizoram and others, thousands of dogs are still illegally captured and cruelly transported from neighboring states to be brutally slaughtered for consumption. Slightly different in Singapore, animal protection and food safety laws prohibit the sale of dogs and cats as these species are not recognized as food animals. So Thailand, I think has a really interesting history. So up until 2011, there was a significant trade in dogs in na to neighboring countries, and that's notably to Vietnam, with an estimated half a million dogs being traded per year. So the, epice the epicenter of the dog meat trade was Ta Re, a town in Sakon Nakon. Um, once enough dogs were captured, they were transported into Vietnam via illegal border crossings um, along the Mekong River. Um, during this time, there was no legislation that was actually protecting animal welfare in Thailand. However, it was the Animal Epidemics Act of 1999 that actually made it illegal to trade or export dogs without a license. Eventually, a mountain national and international condemnation action was taken to end the export of dogs for meat in, from Thailand. And this required an effective coordination by many government agencies the Royal Thai Police and Marine Police responding along the Mekong River. So over the next few years, thousands of dogs were intercepted and confiscated, and although reports of a limited but continued trade, the smuggling of dogs largely st stopped. Subsequently, the slaughter and consumption of dogs and cats was finally made illegal at the end of 2014, when Thailand introduced its first animal welfare law, the Cruelty Prevention and Welfare of Animal Act. Not so many more, but under the Animal Welfare Act uh, in the Philippines, the slaughter of dogs uh, for human consumption is illegal. Whilst in Switzerland and Europe, it remains illegal to slaughter dogs for their meat, to be sold commercially, but it is legal to humanely slaughter dogs for personal consumption, a practice that is largely adopted by rural farmers. Across the water and more recently in the US, the Dog and Cat Meat Trade Prohib Prohibition Act was introduced in 2018, and that prohibits the slaughter of dogs and cats for food, but with the exception of Native American rituals. So finally, in news just announced over the past few weeks, thanks to HSI Korea and the President's First Lady, South Korea has confirmed that it will introduce a ban that will prohibit the breeding and sale of dogs for consumption which is really great news for over one million dogs that are involved in the trade annually. Um, Lola's going to be talking more about this uh, a little later, but in summary, those involved in the trade, including farmers, slaughterers, restaurant owners, 
will need to submit phase out plans to local authorities um, to be able to be offered any financial to support to move away from the industry. This is wonderful news. The new bill is expected to come into full effect by 2027 and will allow a three year grace period for the industry to shut down completely. Next slide, please. So in, some, in a number of countries where national legislation doesn't exist, some provinces, regencies and cities across the region have actually introduced their own local bans. I'm going to run through three of those now. Um, Cambodia is the first one. Um, and in July 2020, the famous tourist destination of Siem Reap banned the slaughter and trading of dogs for meat. And it was the first and currently the only province in the country to do so. While here in Indonesia, thanks to the continued efforts of the DMFI coalition, 32 localities, including the province of Jakarta and the area encompassing the notorious Tomohon extreme market, have introduced directives prohibiting the dog meat trade. Finally, in 2020, uh, the cities of Schengen and Zhuai um, became the first two main cities in mainland China to outlaw the consumption of dog and cat meat. So even with this legislation in place, there are still many grey areas and there does continue to be a trail of evidence that suggests the trade in some places is still operational. But that said, recognising the issue needs to be addressed is a first step for governments to be able to work towards ending the trade on a national level. So I hope that these examples have demonstrated a variety of solutions and possibilities that could be considered by legislators when considering the most appropriate ways of ending the dog meat trade. And it will be interesting to consider these th further uh, during our workshop sessions. So before I end today, I thought I would just spend a few minutes... Uh, next slide. Next slide, please, sorry. <laughs> uh, to talk about Four Pauses approach to address the issue in the region. And following the suit of many of the countries described, we are urging national governments to introduce legislation that will bring an end to the trade. Next slide, please. Um, based on our theory of change, we identify the dog and cat meat trade causes suffering to millions of animals each year. And to address this as an organization, we aim to establish local um, model localities that introduce local bans, mobilize the public to demonstrate opposition, and apply pressure to government stakeholders to introduce legislation to ban the trade. So rather than continue talking, I thought I'd share a short video with you um, before I close on some of the work that we've been doing um, to end the dog and cat meat trade. So play the video, please. Okay, so just to conclude, um, as I've shown throughout my presentation, there are a number of different legislative instruments uh, that can be um, intended to end or at least curtail the trade, and we've spent some time talking about those today. Um, I hope that these examples can demonstrate a variety of solutions that could be considered by legislators when thinking about the best ways of ending the trade. Banning the dog and cat meat trade at a national level would achieve the greatest impact for millions of dogs and cats every year across the region. And through our campaigning activities, we will continue to urge the governments to take action. So thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure to present here, and I look forward to speaking to you further throughout the afternoon. Thank you.